of this uh, frosty morning and welcome to the session about author rights and managing author rights. Um, really, this session sort of grew out of my work with the Institute of Repository and as authors of scholarly articles and books, you're all familiar with the scenario that um, you submitted your article, it's been accepted, you get back the proofs and with it you get a publishing agreement. Um, and the agreement is really to transfer the rights to your publishers that they can, they can put it forward in their, on their platform. Now, um, most of us will probably just sign the agreement and return it without thinking much of it because it seems to be part of the bargain of getting published in a reputable journal with a reputable publisher. Um, however, some issues may arise further down uh, the line in the future when you try and do something else with your work, when you try and, for example, email the published PDF um, to a colleague somewhere where you think of translating um, your work to another language, where you want to perhaps post the article on your personal website. And as you reread your agreement with a publisher, you find you don't actually have the rights to do any of those uh, things any longer, because you've transferred those rights to the publisher. So I guess the most of you are vaguely aware that you can negotiate with your publishers, but how? Um, so in this session, I really wanted to go over some examples um, of take a closer look at publishing agreements and discuss the implications of their terms. We also look at some real life examples of how faculty at Georgetown, Georgetown Law, negotiated successfully with their publishers. And finally, what you can do uh, with your work once you've um, successfully negotiated and how we can really ensure that your work is disseminated as widely with the broadest impact possible. Um, before I hand over to uh, my colleagues and experts here, I'd like to point out some of this information is on the library website under copyright, manage your rights, and I hope that a recording of the session will be posted there uh, in the future. So for future reference, you can refer your colleagues to the recording of this session. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our speakers. We have uh, on one hand, uh, Professor Pro Rebecca Tushnet, who is Professor of Law at Georgetown Law School, and a specialist in copyright and educational property and Roger Scalbeck, who is Associate Law Librarian for Electronic Resources at Georgetown University Law Library, and also Jump Professor of Law. And with that, I hand over to Roger and Rebecca. Okay. Um, what, I, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what we've done in the library at the law school, and give some ideas of sort of ideas that we've had in trying to advocate for faculty to both talk amongst themselves and talk to publishers in getting things online. I'll show you some examples of what we have here, and I was talking to Mark earlier, what we're trying to do is make especially the clauses available as to where um, these things are and the types of agreements that people put together. Um, and then um, Rebecca has things to say, and I thought the biggest thing, especially for an intimate group here, is engage in discussions, ask questions. Um, to hear uh, the two of us talk may be interesting, but to talk about real problems and real issues is probably gonna be more valuable, whether it's from your own work or, or things you've heard about from colleagues. So within the library, um, we manage um, a number of things. I mean, one of the things that we've done with our faculty is put together a collection of copyright agreements. Um, one thing that we've heard from faculty as we're putting things online, whether we're distributing them for working papers or for institutional repository or just helping people deal with you know, distributing their scholarship, as they say, you know, first thing we ask is, do you have the right to do this? You know, can we put it in this collection? Can we put it in that collection? That kind of thing. Often they'll say, well, I think so or, oh, sure, sure I do, but they haven't maybe necessarily looked to the agreement or negotiated something specific. On the law side, a lot of law journals, though certainly not all of them, are a little bit more amenable to um, free access to things, but a lot of our, our uh, professors are uh, multidisciplinary and things like that, so they're publishing in other areas. So one thing that we did in the library, and I'll show you this, and this is an area that I can give you examples of some of the agreements. What we put together is a collection of agreements between um, faculty and publishers, um, and it's on a SharePoint site that we have. Um, and what we've done is we've put together a collection of agreements where we went out and talked to faculty, said, can we have a copy of the agreement? What did you negotiate with your publishers? Then we organized these things together. Um, I'll try to blow this up a little so we can see a little bit more about um, what the nature of them is. So then what we did is we took all these out and said, well, what, what are the concepts or what are the categories of things that um, people have negotiated for this? So in the first, and these are all here, and I'll sort of walk through them and, 
to answer your question. So author retains copyright, so you retain completely all of the rights. Maybe the journal has the right of first publication or things like that. Journal obtains the copyright. Um, there's educational use provisions. There's SSRN, SSRN, Social Science Research Network, you know, provisions to put it there at a particular branded name of a repository. Institutional repository, that's the one that we have, and there's different styles of that. Personal website, and then different time delay provisions and things like that that we put together. And then what we did with these is that each of these will link through to the actual agreement, and the agreement may have multiple aspects of these different um, these different elements. Um, so for instance, under the author retains copyright, there's two things that we've done here. One, we're trying to give people actual clauses they can have. So if you're in the last minute, you're just about to go you know, to do something with the publisher, say, great, just sign this. We need to send it to the printer, to the student review group, to the whatever, to have it done. We want faculty to have a quick access to say, OK, let me put in a clause for this. I want to make sure that this is in the agreement between you and us. So there's that kind of last minute piece. And also, if it's a matter of, well, I kind of do want this, but I'm not sure how to express it. That's um, what we've done. So what we did is extracted here um, some of the clauses themselves. Author cannot republish an article until it has appeared within the journal. And then it doesn't preclude these kinds of things. So kind of walk through here. What I'll do is, again, share with Mark to distribute online copies of these clauses so we can see what are some specific um, pieces of language that um, people have negotiated for. So there's that. And those are various different ways um, that faculty, um, including um, Professor Tushnet here, have negotiated. The journal has exclusive right to reproduction um, after two years after execution of the agreement, whichever is shorter. So there's different ways that that's kind of put together as an agreement. Um, some of these we didn't pull out the particular clause, but it shows it's reflected in there. The next thing would be in an area where maybe the publisher um, maintains the copyright. Um, and then, then there's different provisions based on you know, the publisher you know, retaining it. You can still, for instance, use it for educational purposes. Perhaps you can still um, put things online, or you can do things with it after a particular um, publication date or a you know, time period has, has um, gone by. So those are another set of things there. Educational use provisions. Um, another thing there is you know, permitted to make copy for personal use, including personal classroom use. You know, that's a pretty common, pretty standard thing that we try to advocate for people where it's just plain language. The other thing we try to do is have a variety of clauses here so people can go for sort of more, it depends on sort of the sophistication and the expectations of the publishing group as to how much they want. We, we try to have things that are very simple and very straightforward as to what's understood within the agreement that's executed. You know, author gives the right to, um, to the journal to um, use, or the journal gave permission for educational use that type of thing that's in here. And so there's a variety of clauses that are in there. And then um, then another one, since SSRN is a big area that in the social sciences, and especially our law faculty, are, are distributing their scholarship. Um, and, you know, there's different things here that we wanted to pull out specifically for that, such as you know, nothing in this contract is intended to prohibit from putting it on SSRN. And then by a corollary, we decrest the number of working paper distributions here. So, yeah. What is SSRN? Oh, SSRN is, um, if you go to SSRN.com, you can see it there. It's a uh, working paper um, repository um, for people active in the social sciences. Um, in the law school area, it's um, pretty well respected and widely read um, you know, group of papers that are distributed freely. The school pays to have different journals or different series of things put there, but faculty themselves can distribute them, um, um, typically without cost. <coughs> yeah. Can everyone access the copyright agreement examples, or is it just faculty and staff access? To staff can as well. Yeah. Um, the one trick to getting into it is that because we put it, we wanted it in a place where you had to log in to get it, because there's copies of people's signatures and there's you know personal negotiations between people. Um, it's I don't think it's set for main campus people to access, but we could you know figure that out. Yeah, yeah, okay, because I'm just trying yeah. to access it. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's not, for whatever reason, it's, it's on SharePoint, which has Law Center ID credentials, not, mm -hmm. not others. Um, and we can look at doing that. Um, I'm sorry, I have one more question. Sure, yeah, yeah. And I guess we'll get to the weeds yeah. a little more, but um, we just have one question. Having an educational use provision, isn't that automatic? I mean, I thought that was fair use. Done. Am I jumping ahead? No, no, no. Let's, <laughs> We want to just talk to you about <coughs> your interests and concerns. But, you know. So, um, so 
I would say basically any educational use is, is probably a fair use. Of yeah. course, I've been tilting that way. However, there's a little wrinkle if you do it and you promise not to. Right? So, uh, uh, it is, so your publisher might say, we don't even have to get into fair use. You, you, know, you gave us the rights, and, and so we have an agreement. Uh, now, will they? Probably not. But it affects your ability to do things like actually sort of make this available, right? So um, if you bury it in your courseware site, yes, I mean, uh, you're going to be fine as a practical matter. But if you want to make your syllabus, say, freely available, um, that, and so that you know, someone who's not at the university can see what's in it, then you, you need to think harder about what the agreement says you can do. So oh, you mean like if I had a personal website and right. I posted an article that I wrote right. and I argued it was for educational use, but really anybody in the world could go look at it? Is that what you mean? And then, you know, I think it's still fair use, but at least uh, there would be right. it, there would be more of an argument right. that you would have with the public. Gotcha. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and the other thing, the other reason that that is good to preserve is that, um, you know, there are certain publications, and these are really edge cases, but the Harvard Business Review, mm -hmm. If you publish in that, they are really restricted as to what you can do. They even have the, a, a license that runs to the university. Typically, I don't know if this has changed. A license that runs to the university that says, without payment to us, you are prohibited from putting this on coursework. Even though through different ways you can have direct links to articles and things like that, and you can have ways that you can be authenticated as a community user within Georgetown, absent an agreement specific running to you as the author, um, that particular publisher, and they're the really most extreme case that I know, would prevent um, you from doing that without you know paying for putting the course pack or reproduction or things like that. Um, and then the other thing that so there's a series of things here, and then you know other things like putting it on a personal website and whatnot. I think that's a good one where you know some of them say you can do one type of, of repository or online collection, but not another. What we try to advocate is ask for something that's both as broad as possible and as, as wide as possible to interpretation. Say, put online for open access for, versus put on your personal website. You know, because your personal website, people see their author collection of published papers on a syndication site like SSRN or ePress or something like that as personal, but you know, on the, technically if you kind of read into it, it might not be seen as personal in that sense. So that, so can I give an example of why yeah. asking for breadth is, is important? So I'm actually working um, with a group right now. Um, I work in, part of my work is in fandom studies. And so there are a lot of non-legal articles about uh, studying different kinds of fandoms. And this is a new project to basically create an, uh, a subject matter repository of stuff, you know, going back through the 70s, um, if we can get it done, where it would be available, uh, sort of freely available, at least uh, to anyone who asked. Um, and that's the kind of thing where the license, if the license says, it specifies a personal use or specifies uh, a particular repository, then it's much harder to do that. Whereas if it says, you know, subject matter repository, then we can make one um, and you know use it in a in a in a, in a new way that people you know weren't even thinking about um, when they published it. Exactly. And another nice feature of the collection that we have, since we have kind of people in a, in a single discipline, is that we also list the journals people have published in, so that if you're about to, like, you know, if somebody else was about to publish something in the UCL Law Review, they could say, contact Professor Foreman and say, how, what did you, how did you get that agreement? Or, oh, you know, sort of evidence of, yes, it's proven that somebody has negotiated that, or here's language that that particular journal has accepted, that type of thing. And I think that that's been, I don't know how widely used it is, but when we advocate it or show it to people, Oh yeah, that's useful. You know, that's that's nice to have um, there in that sense. Another thing I'll, I'll put here, and this one is available um, freely online, is that um, at the top of the page here, um, Science Commons has. I'll we'll link to it here so we can look at it. So Science Commons has this uh, Scholars Copyright Author Addendum, and I'll get into that and show that, and then we can spend kind of the rest of the time talking about examples and and, and exploring questions. Um, what they have is they have. Um, something and it talks to you about kind of what the scope of this is, but they have something that is used to generate an addendum to a contract. One thing that our authors have said is that, you know, some, some people say, well, it's hard for us to amend a contract because these are boilerplate things wrapped in a PDF that's not editable. 
Well, if you can have a written agreement that you agree between author and publisher that it is an addendum to and, and contained within the contract, then that, um, if you want to see it, it's at scholars. Um, scholars.sciencecommons. I've actually made copies of them. Oh, you have to copy them. Oh, good. Various agreements you can generate from here. So there are four different choices, I think, with awesome agreement types. And I have co co copies here that you can, you can take a look at as well. Some as well. And then, so for this one, if you wanted to do it, say, well, you know, say I wrote Theory of Evolutionary Standards, Journal of Evolution and Science, Author Information, and in there, Publisher of Tendon Springer, so somebody maybe that's not too amenable to you know, these kind of things, perhaps unlikely. Then what they do is there's, there's a frequently asked questions section to what the different author agreements mean. What I'll do is I'll pull up each of these and, and kind of see the, what the generated output is. So delayed access here is uh, one of them. So then this generates an addendum and we'll open the PDF to look at it. And there's four different ones and they just basically have different types of clauses. The advantage to this is it's very simple and you can just say, here, I'm gonna sign this and put this on as the last page of our agreement. The downside to this is it's not, it doesn't deliver to you a Word document that you might then negotiate something different um, to or or edit the way that um, things show up. So and I'd like to add that this generator is also linked from the library homepage under Manage Your Rights, so you can find it there. Yeah. And so then, author retains non-exclusive right to create derivative works from the article, to reproduce, distribute, publicly perform, publicly display, and all those kind of things. And um, so there's different things there, and you can explore those by, by linking to it there um, from, from the site that Mark mentioned, or um, look at it directly. And I think a big thing here, uh, one thing to note is, if there's ever any restriction on derivative rights, I, I, that's kind of a red flag to me. If the publisher says they retain the copyright, you know, you can negotiate that in fair use and, and educational use. Uh, I mean, correct me if, if you disagree, Rebecca, but if the publisher says we, we maintain you know, the right to any derivative works, to me that's kind of a difficult thing. A derivative work would be, you know, a new version of something. The derivative work can be a translation. I mean, it's maybe an edge case that you translate into another language exactly the same ideas, but if you wanted to make a new version of something, if you wanted to make, you know, a derivation, you know, like you, you know the, the, the verb to be. If you ultimately publish, say, a, a, a revised version of the chapter in your book, I mean, that, uh, so you definitely want the ability to do that. Now, sometimes, depending on the, the contract, it might be fair to say, you know, I won't authorize the publication of a competing edition, right? Uh, right. That's the kind of thing that a, a publisher, could, uh, you know, could reasonably ask for as long as, you know, as long as your contract continues in force. Uh, you know, if you're if you're going to write a textbook, this will be the only textbook in the area that you write. That's, that's fair, but you're right. The, a broad derivative works right is, is disturbing in part because if your uh, if your relationship ends, you know, and then they say, okay, let's have, you know somebody that you hate revise it and issue it as the revised edition, you know, by the two of you, um, that's going to be a problem for you as a scholar. And that's actually come up in it, 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 the law school case it, before. It actually right. does happen. Yeah. Right? Uh, Where people are named authors on case books. And I mean, do you know, I mean, the, the details of them? Or? Uh, well, uh, there, there's, there's just one litigated case as far as I know, but um, and the contract said that they could issue um, supplements and revisions um, and they went ahead and did so um, without the permission of the original authors. Uh, and in the end, uh, the authors got some, uh, uh, were able to reassert control, but it took them a lawsuit, uh, you know, which is not the position that you want to be in. Uh, before you take away from here, I'd like to point out one thing. Um, published version. Um, this specifies what you're talking about. And it's something that it's, it's worth paying attention to. Some publishers will give you permission to do something with other versions of your article. So be careful what you're talking about. They may say, okay, you can post a pre-referee version or, or whatever other version. But depending on what you're working on, it may be no good. I mean, would you really want to post the version of the article in the, in the state that was before peer review? Probably not. Um, so it, it's, it's worth paying attention to the type of clauses where they define what version, what type um, of file we're talking about. Publishers PDF is probably what you would like to see here. 
So should we pull up? Let's pull up one of the other agreements here. So that's delayed access. What's the floor? Um, access and reuse. We'll get that and see if there's any other clauses in this one that are worth exploring. And are there, okay. let's ask other questions or talk about experiences you've heard of or concerns that you've had over um, things. So how open are publishers to these kinds of addendums? Um, I, I can imagine that, you know, if you publish with like the really big ones, Elsevier or so, they're like, okay, send it somewhere else. We don't do yeah, that. Um, some are more amenable than others, I guess it's a sort of unhelpful response to that. Um, I think that increasingly they're more responsive, but you know, it's, it's hard for me to know well what the answer is because in the discipline that I'm most active in, in supporting and, and, and following the law, people tend to like, A, not make a lot of money selling articles, and there's not a lot of sort of commercial publishers in the area. There are in terms of West and Lexus and things like that, but they're not selling law review type content. Um, so, Rebecca, do you have any other experiences as to you know, how amenable people are, or? So, uh, I think they are getting more amenable as they realize that uh, that, so, I mean, where, where it really shows up in law because of the uh, weird dynamics of law reviews is in the case books, uh, where there really is a very you know, big market um, that they charge unconscionable prices. Uh, uh, anyway, um, and even there, it turns out, uh, if you pay attention, there's room to negotiate, um, in particular for things like electronic uses, right? So. Uh, the publishers want the electronic, to sell the electronic case books for the same amount as they sell the physical one, even though they're not producing it. And it turns out that there is pushback. Uh, there's, there's room to maneuver. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think what tends to happen is people establish a beachhead, sort of an author establishes a beachhead, and then the publisher realizes they can survive that term and is able to spread um, in a particular field. So at least that seems to be what, what I've seen. And I should probably add that I have been dealing with a, a few different subjects, areas, and disciplines in like my function as co administrator for the institutional repository. I've been looking at papers published in classics, in uh, foreign policy, uh, in foreign languages, and so on and so forth. And I, I find that it's very difficult to predict how publishers would react. In a number of cases, I've gone out to the publisher requesting that we get the right to post the article in our institutional repository, which is something we try to do actively and try and encourage people to do. Um, and the response varies from publisher to publisher and even from title to title. Um, I found, for example, that one university, University Press, was willing uh, to grant us that repository right for one type but not for another. Partly because they were publishing on behalf of a society um, in one case and on, on their own uh, call for, uh, for another. So it's very difficult to predict, but um, I suppose the, the positive side of that is that you don't have to be daunted. It's worth a try because you get some something in return. What is also worth mentioning is that a lot of the, the, the big trade publishers, so the Wiley Blackwells, the Elsevier, the Springers, and so on and so forth, have policies in place that allow for some of those things that you might want to be doing, and those are posted publicly. So it is, for example, the case that the, the Cambridge University Press will allow you to do certain things with, with regard to institute repositories. Um, but that's not to say that you have to rely exclusively on that, but you can actually take the initiative of reaching out, using one of those agreements to st take a step further beyond those uh, publisher policies, and I think it's worth it. Not to be an alarmist here, but it's always nice to talk about extreme cases. <laughs> what I pulled up here is, um, this is an, in an area of, um, this was actually something published by a, a law professor. Um, she was contacted by the journal, and, and they said, you, know, you can publish this under open access. She said, oh, that's great. Well, OK. I said, oh, then it's no problem. You can just you can execute this for you. Can, it'll be Creative Commons. That's fine. So what they wanted is they wanted $3,250 to publish one article under Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. And it's a Creative Commons right that's non-commercial, no derivative attribution. So you could publish it, 
But you couldn't give it, I mean, you couldn't do things that you might expect to do, say, allow another colleague at another school to use it in classroom. And that's an edge case, and you could probably, you know, defendably, you know, do that. But, you know, this is, I think, this is a very extreme position. But, I mean, this is, I think, drives home the importance of, you know, thinking about how things are negotiated and knowing that some publishers really are aggressive in this area. Like, this is the worst one that I've seen that literally, you know, they, they want $3,200 just so that the world could read what you wrote in a published journal. It's actually less than that to pay for a year's subscription to this electronically. So it's, it's and, and, and also the, the agreement where they, and then part of this was they announced that we have an open access program for our articles. Well, you can't read their open access program announcement because you have to be a subscriber to that, which surprisingly Georgetown wasn't. So, um, you know, that's not to be alarmist, but that's, that, that's a very edgy thing. There are really you know, bad, you know, things that could happen with this. I have $2,500. $2,500. And then, I mean, your grant probably didn't cover that, right? <laughs> oh, your <laughs> salary didn't either, right? Yeah. I mean, these, and when I saw that, I was like, really? And I asked around, and people were like, well, they have seen things like this, but yeah, it's just phenomenal. How long does it usually take, I mean, you get your contract and they want to sign it, you're going to send your amendment, you know, a, addendum to along with the contract. Does it add extra time to to the normal process, or is it just usually you know quickly settled? It, it depends on the publisher. I don't know what your experience has been. Yeah, you know, uh, it also depends uh, on how off the rack your change is, right? So if you're asking for an institutional repository, at this point, any publisher that knows what it's doing, know, you know, knows what an institutional repository is and has a policy, or will make, you know, or will make one up for you. So, uh, uh, I think in most cases, the meetings have already been held, right? And they're just going to decide whether to give you what they're willing to give you or not. Uh, so, I, I haven't experienced much delay. Yeah, and I think, I mean, a big thing too is since a number of the people kind of putting together these kind of boilerplates for right. advocacy type of things, mm -hmm. the, the, the clauses are sound, uniform, and, you know, like they're just there for you to see. You know, I, I think that generally <coughs> they're, you know, they're going to be accepted or not. People aren't going to quibble over your word. Whereas if you wrote it yourself, they might say, well, it's not quite the language that I've seen before, so now we're going to delay. But if they see something like this, I think, you know, again, like, like Professor Shisha suggests, they will or won't, what's based on their experience, but they're not going to then have to you know, sweat over the language. Of it. Another thing that Clark alluded to here, I think this is another example of a clause that's really important to get. You know, the other one said um, final version, or you know, published version. Well, publisher's additional commitment. Publisher agrees to provide author within 14 days of first publication at no charge in electronic copy and PDF format. You know, nowadays, enough of the journals are online electronically such that that happens. It's going to be on JSTOR, it's going to be on LCB or EBSCO or whatever. But if they're not doing that, and if they're not doing that in a way that's unencumbered by some kind of protection, mm -hmm. then that's a problem. But if you negotiate that, or if you're able to get that, that's really useful. Because <coughs> then you can give it to your students and they can print it without a problem. If it's generated from an electronic you know, document, they can then also select text and copy it, put it into their notes and things like that. So I think that's another um, clause that I'm, I'm glad to see here in the language they're very straightforward as to you know what they're asking for and, and how it's spelled out. And again, that's putting commitment on the publisher side. They're getting something out of your content as well. They're, they're getting hopefully good content because that's what they want if they've agreed to publish it. Roger, can we go back to the negotiation part? Sure, um, absolutely. Am I right in thinking that these addenda is set up in such a way that you, you sign them and add them to the publishing agreement and they come in force unless there is pushback from the publisher. I mean, is there much to and fro, to and fro? Or are they set in such a way that unless there's an objection, they, they answer? So, so legally speaking, the, this is a contract that specifies how it can be accepted. It's actually a counteroffer that specifies how it can be accepted. And it actually says it can be accepted by publishing the paper. So uh, if, they, if they don't object and go ahead with publishing, this, this says, and the addendum becomes effective, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty standard you know, uh, for really almost any contract that you receive. Like you know, any service contract you might sign will often say, like, by paying the money, you know, you agree to everything we've said here. So uh, now the publisher 
may or you know may or may not like that. Um, it does it all the time itself, but that doesn't mean they like it when it's done to them. But um, it is set up that way so that if, if there is no negotiation, then that's it. You know, this is enforced. <coughs> in real terms, since you've negotiated a couple of, uh, number of times, as I can see, has there been much to fro between you and the publisher? So, in in my experience, no. Um, again, you know, law law has some weird dynamics. The the situation I've encountered where I really had to negotiate have all been sort of very specialized things. Like I did a, an article with a lot of pictures in it, which were all fair use, uh, and they initially wanted them all clear, uh, and I said no. Uh, and uh, we went back and forth, and, and eventually, uh, uh, so I, I got an opinion letter from somebody else saying they were fair use, and then they went ahead and published it. Um, and uh, I'm happy to talk about that because I think that's super important too. You know, the public using images in your work or using tables right from somewhere else can be really important, and the publisher's practices there are terrible too. Um, but uh, but that's where I've actually really found the need to negotiate. The, the provisions about preprints or you know, institutional repositories. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the message is spreading. So it, it's not like a shock to most, to most people when you ask for that. Okay. That <coughs> reminded me of, um, so I'm, I'm in history, which obviously we publish journals, but I was sort of more concerned about book contracts, and I don't know if you were going to talk about that at all. The, the, the image thing came up for me where I got permissions, but um, most archives where I got images would not give world rights, which my press eventually agreed to, but they, what they wanted was world rights for pictures, and they, gave, they got some lesser version of that. I don't know what, but um, just wondering how, if you have suggestions along these lines for book so, so there, um, I mean, now some people actually manage to get their contracts to say, you know, and I can distribute online if that's something that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, there are some presses that are that will actually go with that. Yale has, Duke has, um, and you know, they feel like I, I think they feel that they have a substantial enough customer base that the that if there's if people just want to download and read it for their own edification, that just yeah. you know spreads the, the spreads the brand in, in some ways. Um, in terms of, so the archive publisher, your, your interaction, you're kind of whipsawed, right? Because you have these two entities that, that are completely, they don't have any relationship with each other, they're uninterested in each other's yeah. priorities, um, and the archives are often saying things that don't really have a basis in law, but on the other hand, they won't let you in unless you agree, right? Yeah. So, so uh, this, with arch I think it, it really actually has to focus on the archives in your negotiations right. and yeah, to okay. say, okay, you know, do you, you know, do you really have any rights in these? Like, what you know, if the copyright wasn't transferred to you, um, you know, right. it, then then you have no particular interest in this, and you do you should have an interest in scholarship. So you know, uh, w one thing that can sometimes work is to is to say, you know, I'm not asking for a license for you from you. I would just want I just want a statement saying that you won't assert any rights against me, right? So mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, because the archives worry like, well, what if we get sued, right? right? Uh, and if the archive just says like, we're not gonna we're not gonna assert any rights we have, then they're not they're not claiming that they have the right to give you anything, right? They're just saying like, we're gonna stay out of it. And sometimes that's a way to make the archive comfortable, and then you can go to the publisher say, and say, "Well, you know, and it's fair use, or and these images are out of copyright anyway." So, so uh, that's that's one way. But uh, I think you you have to focus on the archive and then convincing them to let you do it right. because the that's the bigger barrier. And then um, another question about books, <coughs> reprinting. Um, so I didn't have a problem with this, but I could see a potential problem in my book. Um, two sections of it were reprinted in a reader, mm -hmm. like a case book for um, sociology, which was funny because I'm a historian. I was um, but, um, and that, and we don't need, per they don't need to get my permission from that. Harvard has the right to decide that. Are there ways, and that didn't bother me, except like one, I don't know unless I come across it. And 
unless they end up getting paid for it, and then I see that a little bit in my royalties. But secondly, what if they were, is there ways, are there contracts where you can bet that? Like, what if somebody wanted to publish part of mine in a, you know, Nazism is right. awesome reader or something? So not that anything in there could be construed as expressive, but you know what I mean, but using, publishing it in some place where it might be. So you can do what you, uh, you, can, you can propose that. Um, what you want to do is recognize that the publisher has interest in making things run smoothly too. So for example, um, one thing that you can do to make that sweet, uh, sweeter to the publisher say, you know, um, I would like to be notified um, if, there, if there's you know, a, a reprint and just put it in the contract, right? If, if the publisher grants reprint rights, you know, the author will be notified and will have, you know, 10 days to object. And if, uh, so you want to say, you want to make it a default. Like, if I don't object, you can go ahead and do it, uh -huh. right? And that way, the, the publisher has a lot more confidence because it's not just hanging there, right? right? Um, because the last, the publisher doesn't want to be in a situation when it, where it doesn't know what it can do. And if you just say, like, I have to get permission, then the publisher's going to feel like, well, you know, that could really leave us hanging out to dry, and, you know, these anthologies need to go to press. Right. But if you have a specific thing where you say, and I'll object within 10 days, if not, you can go ahead, then that's a much more reasonable ask from the publisher's perspective. One other area, you know, to your point of how accepted are these terms and, and you're looking at some negotiated things, another area that I think is worth thinking about and looking into is Creative Commons. Um, yeah, so Creative Commons licenses, the nice thing about them is that they're, relative, they're very well understood the, the way that they're written, there's there's multiple levels of it, and, and especially when things get published online, there's kind of a human readable version that that looks very simple to see. There's a there's a, a, a binding legal side of it, and then there's when it gets put online, there's also some some legal code that can be embedded into digital objects that sort of <coughs> supports what's available. An easy example of that is a photo on Flickr. If you if you take a nice photo photograph and you say, you know what, anybody can use this for whatever they want, they just have to say it was my picture. So that's an attribution only license. Very uniform as to the way it's understood, the way it's executed. You can go to the Creative Commons website and then basically write, um, like to pick one of the licenses a very simple way, and I can try to pull up their site here, um, and do that. And I think increasingly um, uh, more publishers are understanding those. And again, um, to, to the earlier comments of they're gonna know whether or not they allow you to put it into an institutional repository. Probably sophisticated publishers are going to know whether or not they'll accept a Creative Commons license, and then more specifically, whether they'll accept a Creative Commons license that allows for, for instance, attribution only, or non-commercial use, or derivative works, or things like that. And the most sort of open one of all of them is, is attribution only, which simply means you can sell it, you can print it, you can do whatever you want, make derivative works, just say it came from me as the creator. And, and also, the other thing that's nice about Creative Commons, thinking about it, is that um, if you're creating works and you want to include visuals, you want to include photographs, you want to include some kind of material where you don't want to have to negotiate an agreement between the creator of that content and you as the author. It could be a blog post, it could be a short form article online for a journal or something like that, especially in the photography area. It's very easy to go out find things, understand what your rights are, and use very beautiful and elegant things without having to kind of go through that negotiation process. And increasingly, there's no more collections of content online where it's not just photographs. It's, it's written works, it's, it's up documents, it's, it's um, you know, real substantive content that, that's available for reuse. The thing to know about that, though, is if you're going to be using others' work, is those licenses come with requirements. If you know, if, if there's a particular one that says no commercial use, you can't put it into something and then use it later for commercial purposes. Or, you know, if it says you have to share your works alike, which was that's one of the elements is called share alike. If you use it, then you have to sort of use those um, Creative Commons um, requirements in the work that you create. But the last thing to think about that is that even all of those terms are negotiable. There was a photographer who had put a picture out there that was attribution only that um, somebody for the original Iron Man um, movie saw, and they said, they said, can we use your picture? He says, that's great, you just need attribution. They're like, no, you need to be like 
making a million dollars from this movie to get your name in the credits. He says, no, just, just say it was me. And I said, well, how about we pay you a couple thousand dollars? She says, oh, that's cool. Well, that'll be fine. So it was under this license that they could have been freely used, but they negotiated something separate for that. Good. Anything else? Questions? Rebecca, is there anything else in Creative Commons in terms of well, acceptance or reuse? Do you think that I'm kind of missing so the... No, so I mean, I, I have to say I'm I'm actually I'm more optimistic about the the science commons stuff just because Creative Commons um, uh, is is pretty much as far as you can go, right? So um, it may and often it might be a starting point, um, but but really for scholars' purposes, it's often enough to make sure like it's going to be available somewhere on the open internet, right? So. I don't necessarily want to put it everywhere, but I want to put it in my institutional repository. Plus, I want to be able to make sure that you know any educational use by myself or a colleague is fine, right? Um, so, uh, I, t I tend to think this, the science comes uh, uh, type uh, provisions you know work pretty well um, in in most cases, um, and you know and. And if you get pushback, one of the things I think is there are different things to ask for. And in particular, the difference between the preprint and the reprint. Right? So the preprint is what you send to them, and the reprint is the beautiful, you know, well-formatted thing uh, that they put out. And often, for purposes of you know, sharing scholarship, the preprint is you know, your work and is, uh, is a worthy thing to have out there, even if, you know, it ends up saying like insert table seven about here, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're you're still conveying ninety percent of what you want to be conveying, and you're conveying it to new audiences who, you know, might you know might never have known that it existed. So um, I, I would I would just say you know there are a lot of different alternatives, and and you know, be be willing to consider which ones serve your purpose. Anything else in terms of resources here that we're missing or that we should um, find? I think we have covered perhaps uh, last last thing, if you can pull up the library's webpages, I want you to point out uh, where some of this information is held yeah. here. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the library webpage, if you just uh, Oh yeah. Okay, so we have under scholarly communications and copyright on the right hand side, there's a copyright page. Well, my predecessor, and the manager you're right, you've got some of these things. Um, the Scholarly Commons, Science Commons, addendum generator is linked from here, because that's the site we saw earlier. And also a variety of other things, so there's Rich Commons here, there's um, Spark that lists some numerous alternative third publishing options. So if you're interested, come here. If you have any questions, um, you can also contact me directly. Uh, my email is spf97. Um, I'm sure that Roger can do, uh, do some questions as well. Um, finally, uh, since I mentioned the institutional repository, I just wanted to point out that that also exists here under Digital Georgetown, the left-hand side. Uh, and we encourage people to submit to our institutional repository. We have the moment a uh, collection of papers, theses, working papers, other pub departmental publications uh, throughout the university. We would like this to grow um, substantially over the next uh, a few months. So you can take a look here and uh, browse through to get an idea of what's inside. And um, if, you, if you like, uh, submit. It's, it's fairly easy to do that. So we can take a look for, uh, for example, uh, the School of Foreign Service. They have all these different kinds of publications that they list here. Yeah, so once you get the, you know, the clause that says you can put it in the IR, <laughs> marks for blue. Yeah. So thank you very much. and. Um, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.